Welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and I'd like to welcome you to a webinar where we're discussing emerging strategies in covalent inhibition. So, and in particular, we're going to look at the development of covalent inhibitors in drug discovery. A fascinating topic for which we've paired up with Concept Life Sciences. Now, they've supplied these fantastic guests for us today. They, as a company, offer a comprehensive range of discovery and development services and analytical solutions across the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, agrochemical and food sectors. So they are exactly the right people to look at these sorts of emerging developing strategies in fields like drug discovery. We're delighted to have them with us today. Over the course of the next hour, we'll delve into the synthetic methodologies, pharmacology and overall drug discovery considerations associated with the development of covalent inhibitors in drug discovery. So hopefully by the end of the hour, you'll have learned about the fundamental aspects of developing covalent inhibitors in drug discovery. You have discovered more about the new warheads that are under development. You'll understand the in vitro and in vivo considerations associated with this therapeutic strategy, and you'll develop a field for the emerging paradigms of the field. We have four guests with us today. We have pre-recorded their presentation, but they are here live with us to take on all of your questions. You can see them on screen right now, either just above or just next to my face. Uh, those guests are Tilly Bingham, Matilda Tilly Bingham, who's the VP of Science at Concept Life Sciences, uh, Caroline Rigby, Senior Chemist, and then Jamie Stokes and, ja and Daniel Glynn, who are Principal Scientists at Concept Life Sciences as well. You'll hear far more about them and from them in the course of the recording and then the Q&A, but also we want to get to know a bit about you. So we've got a few polls coming up as well. Do please uh, get involved with the polls. It really helps us to know who our audience are, what they're interested in, how their own work experience and reality fits in with the sorts of topics that we talk about in our webinars. So please do engage with those. Likewise, there will be a poll on exit, an exit survey. It's really helpful for us. Please just spend a couple of minutes just to fill that in. There's only two or three questions. It won't take long. and It really does mean a lot to us. So thank you for that. The software that we're using today is GoToWebinar. This might be familiar now. We've all done a lot of webinars this year, so this might be one of the platforms you've used before. Uh, the main thing that this is uh, great for is for interaction with our speakers, and that's why we've got them here to do live Q&A after the presentation, and this is your real best opportunity to ask them questions, find out more about these emerging strategies and how it can apply to your own work. So the best way to do that at, at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel, which by default should appear on the right hand side of your screen, uh, there is a box where you can ask a question to us. So any question you have at any point throughout the webinar, just get it into that box there and we'll be able to pick it up and get it to the right person in the Q&A bit at the end. So yeah, any questions you have at any point, just get them in there. If you miss any part or want to see any part of this again, then we don't share the, uh, the slides from this because we believe that the context of what's being said at the time is incredibly important and just as important as what's on the slides. What we will do is send you a link to the recording so you'll be able to come back and watch any part of this at any point in the future. So just keep an eye out in your inbox for that. And for those of you who have turned up to watch this live, Thank you very much. Nice to have you with us. A little thank you for you. We'll also include a certificate of participation that will be in your inbox at the same time as that link. So do keep an eye out for that in the coming days. So I think that's probably all from me. Let's find out a little bit about you. So let's run our first poll and find out some more about you as our audience. So would you consider a covalent inhibitor strategy for your drug discovery program? Uh, I'm going to give you a, about a minute or so to get your answers in. So do dive in and get your answers in as quickly as you can, because we will run out of time. And then we'll go into the presentation shortly after that. Once we just get an idea of uh, how many of you out there would consider a covalent inhibitor strategy for your drug discovery program. And meanwhile, I can already see people are getting uh, questions in there. So clearly, uh, you know how to use GoToWebinar. I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but it really is useful. And in case people haven't actually used GoToWebinar before, knowing where to ask questions is really key. But thank you, uh, Roshan, for your question already. Uh, I think that's probably just about enough time for the votes. Let's uh, stop the poll now, I think. And just before we go into the presentation, let's have a look. 84% of you, the vast majority of our live attendees today, would certainly consider a covalent inhibitor strategy. 
for your drug discovery program. Well, that means you're in the right place to learn more about what's on the horizon at the moment and what strategies are currently emerging. So thank you very much for filling that out. We're going to go to the first part of the uh, pre-recorded presentation now. There's another poll coming up. Any questions you have at any point, get them in now. But I will now hand over in the recording to Tilly and I'll speak to you again later on. Enjoy. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm Tilly Bingham, VP of Science at Concept Life Sciences. And today we're going to be talking to you about emerging strategies in covalent inhibition. But before we start, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to our company, Concept Life Sciences. We're a UK based contract research organisation serving the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and agrochemical sectors. And along with our sister company, Malvin Panalytical, we're part of the broader Spectrus group. We have a long and established track record of delivering complex programmes for our clients in our specialist therapeutic areas of oncology, immunology and neuroscience. We recognise that the field of drug discovery is continually evolving. And today we have a presentation on an established area of drug discovery research, but one which has seen something of a renaissance in recent years, and that's the field of covalent inhibition. So the talk today is going to be given by um, four speakers. Um, I'm going to begin um, with a, a top line introduction to covalent drug discovery. Um, and then throughout the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on the areas where covalent uh, inhibition as a strategy differs from uh, the more traditional uh, reversible inhibition approaches. The first section will be covered by Caroline Rigby, who's a senior chemist at Concept Life Sciences, and she'll be taking you through um, synthetic methodologies that are relevant for covalent inhibition. She'll then hand over to Daniel Glynn, um, a principal research scientist at Concept Life Sciences, who'll take you through some of the nuances of the in vitro pharmacology, PKPD and toxicology that need to be considered. He'll then hand over to um, Jamie Stokes, who is another principal research scientist at Concept Life Sciences, who will take you through some case studies um, which show the, these principles um, in action. And we'll wrap up in about 45 minutes time with a summary and outlook on some of the new emerging areas in this field. So to begin, I'll just introduce you to the, the concept of covalent drug discovery. And actually, um, covalent inhibition in drug discovery is not new at all. Um, in fact, many drugs act via a covalent mechanism. But I guess in contrast to more modern uh, research in this field, a lot of those mechanisms were not known at the time of discovery of the drug, um, and the approach was effectively serendipitous. As a consequence, although the focus in recent years has been in the field of oncology, there are actually covalent inhibitors across a range of different therapeutic areas, as you can see on the pie chart on the right here. And there are two distinct um, mechanisms of covalent inhibition, um, one the reversible and one which is irreversible, um, which Caroline will go into in a little bit more detail later. And I guess where the modern approaches um, deviate from the more traditional approaches are that the current approach has tended to focus on the irreversible inhibitors. And in this instance, they have tended to target a non-catalytic nucleophile. So if we look at the, the principles that are uh, applied in, in recent years, and we, we take it back to basics and consider what defines um, the mechanism of covalent inhibition of a protein, you can break this down into two steps. So the first step is the non-covalent binding of ligand to the target protein binding site. And this is then followed by an irreversible bond formation between the ligand and target protein. And um, the thermodynamics and kinetics of both of these steps will have an important outcome in terms of how the covalent inhibitor behaves in a biological system. So in this context, there are a number 
of areas which need to be considered during the optimization of your drug discovery program when you are working specifically on a covalent drug discovery project. Firstly, you obviously need a reactive warhead on the ligand. And this is something that needs to react when you need it to in the protein of interest, but to survive uh, the body's defense mechanisms for reactive intermediates when it's in the systemic circulation. You also need a suitably positioned reactive residue on the target protein. And typically this is a nucleophilic residue um, and increasingly in modern drug discovery, a non-catalytic nucleophilic residue. The behavior of the molecule um, in a biological system will be different from inhibitors and therefore you'll need specific assay technology in vitro, which will be able to tease out the mechanism by which your candidate drug is working. You'll also need to understand the implications of this mechanism on the PK and look at potential PKPD disconnects, which can be used to your advantage during the discovery of your drug. So all of these areas are areas that we will bring out throughout this talk. Um, and I would like to hand over first to Caroline Rigby, who's going to take you through some of the considerations for the reactive warhead that you will select for your ligand. Yes, thanks, Tilly. Um, so as Tilly just said, I'm just going to take you a few uh, over a few of the chemistry considerations, both from a design and a synthetic point of view. I'll talk about um, how we match the warhead to the amino acid that we want to target. I'll uh, describe in a little bit more detail the difference between the irreversible and reversible inhibitors that Tilly just mentioned. And then I'll take you through some synthetic considerations on a practical level and just outline a couple of synthetic methodologies within this field. So yes, matching the warhead with the amino acid, it tends to be nucleophilic amino acids that we want to target with these sort of inhibitors. Um, in particular, cysteines, which are the um, have been the focus of most of the attention here. So obviously, we're looking for an electrophilic warhead. Um, so in the case of cysteine, we've got a soft nucleophile, uh, but with a strong nucleophile. So we're looking at things like acrylamides, uh, the substituted acrylamides, alenamides, epoxides, alpha-acetates, and um, if, uh, aldehydes, as I've demonstrated there. Lysine is another uh, amino acid that's been targeted a bit less frequently. So lysine with its pendant amino group, quite often protonated here in physiological systems, but you can find neutral residues. Uh, it's quite it's a lot more abundant than cysteine and it's much harder nucleophile. So we're looking at more harder electrophiles like vinyl sulfones, sulfonyl fluorides, uh, these activated esters on the bottom right, and these um, alpha formyl benzene boronic acids. In terms of oxygen nucleophiles, the you know, alkyl ones like serine and threonine, uh, which are quite highly abundant, but they're not particularly nucleophilic, but they can be activated by neighbouring residues. So again, we're looking at quite hard electrophiles like fluorosulfates, as I've demonstrated there, um, and boronic acid and acids and nitriles. Um, sticking with the oxygen nucleophiles, this phenolic one, tyrosine, which is not very nucleophilic in its neutral state, but once it's deprotonated, the uh, anion is, is quite a good nucleophile. So again, we want, we're want we looking for hard electrophiles, sulfonyl fluorides, fluorosulfates. And then just on the bottom right, there are a couple of examples of targeting methionine, which is quite a rare amino acid, uh, but it does have moderate nucleophilicity. So there's uh, examples of um, this oxaziridine system and epoxides. And just to illustrate this a bit further, this is from paper in Bioorganic and Medicinal Chemistry, where they basically took a, uh, do a range of electrophiles and treated, uh, reacted them with some NBOC amino acid esters and um, just to sort of compare the reactivities. So as you can see, cysteine does tend to be more reactive towards your sort of enomes, um, your, your vinyl sulfide, your acrylate, um, acrylamides whereas serine tends to um, prefer the harder electrophiles like the boronic acids and esters, and your edons are much further down. So as mentioned earlier, 
the, you can think of the covalent inhibitors as falling into two broad categories, irreversible and reversible. So the irreversible ones, you saw this little scheme earlier where the um, a, a long-lasting covalent bond is formed, which can be thought of as being irreversible and essentially, uh, in theory, should last until the enzyme gets turned over. And just that example on the bottom left there is um, a cysteine residue reacting with a microaccept type system. So the sort of warheads we'd be thinking of here would be things like your acrylamides, uh, your sulfonylfluorides and your epoxides. On the other hand, the reversible inhibitors are where the complex is more labile. Uh, so in theory, the, re the activity of the enzyme could recover. Uh, in this little box on the left, I've just put a few examples. The bottom three, so the boronic acid, the sort of aldehyde or ketone and the nitriles are where the complex can dissociate to give you back your enzyme and your inhibitor. The top one's a little bit different where you've got a carbonate or a carbonate where the complex can be hydrolyzed so you don't actually generate your inhibitor in its original form. So some examples on the right here would be things like nitriles, these alpha keto um, amides and the alpha cyanoacrylates. So thinking about this from a synthetic point of view, you know, the actual considerations you'd have to make while you're going to do this chemistry, um, obviously you're dealing with some very reactive targets. So the obvious one is that you tend to introduce the warhead as late as possible in the synthesis. You also have to think about how you handle the reaction mixture. For example, aqueous workup might not be an option and your product might be thermally stable. So you might need to think about things like freeze drying rather than backing things down. Uh, in terms of purification, again, if you're looking at reverse phase chromatography, the pH uh, might be important in relation to the stability of your product. And if you're using sort of scavenger type columns, um, ammonia may not be compatible with these you might need to switch to things like trithalamine to elute your product another thing to consider is that if you've got any side products or any reagents that have carried through from earlier steps that have any kind of nucleophilic character about them they these might react with your product so you generate further side products just to complicate things and then in a similar vein if you've got nucleophilic groups within your target structure you could get um this reacting with itself either inter or intramolecular so um, it might be, you might want to say, remove H bond donors by methylating nitrogens or even add alkyl groups to the molecule to influence the conformation if you're getting ring formation, for example. So just a couple of examples of methodologies uh, in the sort of sulfonyl fluoride series. So the box on the left related to sulfonyl fluorides, which were quite commonly encountered in this sort of um, field. So this is a quite an old paper uh, from 1979, where they can take a, uh, an aryl bromide with benzalmacaptan to make this sulfide, which you can oxidize to give the sulfonyl chloride, which you can then convert into the sulfonyl fluoride. It's actually chlorine gas that they use in the paper, which is obviously not ideal, although that, this can be replaced with NCS, which makes things obviously a lot easier. But you're still dealing with a more reactive intermediate in um, the sulfonyl chloride. Uh, so while this is a, a, a reliable method, there are drawbacks. This example on the bottom left is a much more recent example where, uh, again, taking, taking an aryl bromide, uh, making this sulfonate using DABSO, and then you can convert that through to the sulfonyl fluoride using NFSI. The example on the right are the fluorosulfates, which are part of the same series, but have an extra oxygen uh, in the warhead. And these would traditionally be made by taking a phenol and treating it with sulfur L fluoride gas. But again, in terms of operational ease, this isn't ideal. But there have been a few more and more recent developments of the crystalline shelf stable reagents that I've ex uh, exemplified there on the right, such as FDIT and AISF. I'd just like to finish off by going through uh, a contemporary example. There's a paper that came out this year in the field of sulfur amidimidoyl fluorides. Again, part of related compounds where two of the oxygens have been replaced by nitrogens. Um, so the synthesis, uh, you'd be taking an amine, treating it with cyanyl tetrafluoride to get through to this intermediate, which then you can treat with an amine to get through to your target warhead. And there's 16 examples in this paper, a few of which are shown on the left there. And these were 
shown uh, they showed activity in a few different assays as I've as shown there, and also in a, a part one assay, the survived cell washout in HeLa cells, which demonstrates that the there is covalent inhibition taking place. So on that note, I'd like to pass over to Daniel, who's going to talk a bit about the pharmacology. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, so first, I want to talk about uh, assessing opportunities for covalent inhibition, and then I'll talk a little bit about in vitro pharmacology, and then finally, uh, PKPD relationships, which are, are very unique to covalent inhibitors. So first, we really want to be doing uh, assessment of opportunities for covalent inhibitors. So is there challenges in terms of uh, selectivity profiles that covalent inhibitors will overcome, uh, especially the field of uh, reversible covalent inhibitors are, are, are very um, promising in terms of improving selectivity profiles. Are there deficiencies in potency? Um, and obviously, are there catalytic residues or, or covalent residues within uh, a druggable binding site that's exploitable to drug discovery? Uh, and really, for this, we want to be looking at uh, crystallographic data or structural data to try to look for uh, possible um, opportunities within this field. Um, and then we want to be looking at whether this um, nucleophilic residue is, is uh, available and suitably positioned for uh, vectors for growth for covalent inhibition. And there's two real main strategies for doing this. Uh, typically, within drug discovery, uh, the primary strategy of um, improving potency uh, via ligand deficiency increases, um, and then looking for covalent inhibition by building a vector um, to form that covalent bond uh, is the go-to. Um, but more modern approaches are looking at uh, covalent fragments, where we're looking for um, a slightly more promiscuous uh, binding event, uh, where improves, improvements in the initial KI, the initial binding is then uh, improved. Um, and selectivity of that is also um, improved. And uh, Jamie later will, will talk about a nice example of uh, RAS G12C where they went through a, a covalent fragment approach. So in terms of in vitro pharmacology, what we need to be looking at is uh, a bimolecular rate constant where we have the initial binding, the KI, followed by a secondary final covalent complex, which is uh, deemed a K-inapt. And KI over K-inapt values are the go-to method for um, scouting SAR of, um, of lead chemical series. Um, the literature predominates IC50 values at a given time point, but as you can see from the graph on the left, uh, increase in incubation time uh, gives a lower IC50 value. So IC50 is uh, significantly more potent uh, with increasing um, time. Um, so you need to be very consistent with the time points at which you're uh, generating IC50 values, whereas KI over K I over K and that uh, values are, are absolute. Um, so first, we want to also be looking at um, how well k and over KI then translates into cell-based potency um, if we're moving from a, um, a target-based approach. Uh, and then we want to be looking at evaluating on and off target binding in the biological system of interest. And I'll have a little slide later on uh, chemical proteomics to um, check for selectivity profiles when covalent inhibitors um, can be promiscuous. So the main method to uh, measure KI uh, is typically for mutagenesis studies, uh, where you're replacing the catalytic residue with a glycine, or the other option is to back extrapolate uh, the rate back to T equals zero, where it's presumed that no covalent binding has occurred. So the main go-to assay for um, in vitro pharmacology is a typical washout experiment. Uh, so this is um, followed by acute treatment uh, of the saturating compound, uh, and then the, the cells or the, um, the protein is then extensively washed out and the biological readout assessed. 
Uh, and with covalent inhibitors, the, the, the phenotype, the cellular phenotype, long persists after the washout. Um, so here is an example of uh, interleukin-inducible tyrosine kinase, which is a, an inflammatory target. Uh, and as you can see from the compound 12 and compound 5, they have significant effects after washout. Um, so compound 12 acts like a typical covalent mechanism, whereas compound 5 acts non-covalently. Uh, and just because, you know, you have an acrylamide warhead, um, you know, suitably positioning that to form the covalent adduct is key. And these sorts of experiments need to be run routinely to make sure that your chemical series uh, is running via the mechanism of action that is desired. So the second assay of high interest is glutathione adduct. Um, so we need to check how promiscuous um, your lead series is to glutathione. And this is typically run um, alongside your, your IC50 or your um, KI over K in that uh, screen. Uh, and we should be looking at <clears throat> via mass spectrometry or LCMS, the formation of the covalent uh, glutathione adduct. This also can be undertaken uh, with incubation with liver microsomes uh, to look for covalent metabolites that may be uh, a risk factor uh, in later stage development. Uh, and this needs to be a, a run alongside quite rigorous MET-ID studies to identify what they can be and suitable MedChem strategies to mitigate the minimization of the formation of these covalent adducts. So the third area in vitro pharmacology I'd like to talk about is the biophysical techniques. Uh, and one specific biophysical technique that's very good for analyzing covalent inhibition is SPR. Uh, so this label-free technique in which uh, the protein is fixed to a, a chip and the compound is flowed over, and we're looking at permittivity changes or change in residence angle of the bound uh, covalent inhibitor protein complex. And uh, typically, SPR is used as an orthogonal screening method, especially in hit stage and hit to lead uh, drug discovery programs. But here it can be used to utilize the formation of the covalent bond within the timescales of, uh, of the reaction. With compound seven is two types of dissociation. So initial binding of the compound followed by uh, dissociation consistent with a small amount of rapidly dissociated non-covalent bond, followed by significant amount of covalent bond formation uh, and significant residence time of uh, what's shown here is uh, around four hours. In addition, um, we want to be looking at selectivity profiles and um, chemical proteomics is a uh, an emerging field within, um, within this and especially very prevalent for covalent inhibitors. Um, I spoke previously about reversible covalent inhibitors and how they can be um, key strategies to improve selectivity profiles. So proteomics typically um, consists of the unlabeled proteome and a reactive probe as shown, which is a, a reactive group followed by a linker uh, and a a rhodamine um, uh, molecule attached and um, the, this labels the proteome which uh, when it's digested uh, is analysed by LCMS and, and when we have a lead chemical series this uh, um, competes with the, um, the probe labelling of the proteome and we get um, key selectivity profiles between um, compound treated and non-compound treated um, uh, and then significant data analysis is then undertaken to identify the proteins of interest that are engaging with the target. Um, we should really be looking at um, performing this ideally in living systems, but it can also be undertaken in vitro. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about PKPD toxicology. And uh, a hallmark of covalent inhibition is the PKPD. PD disconnect. Uh, so this is a, a really nice example where we're looking at the PK, the PK profile on the left at three different um, dosing regimes. 
0.31 and 5 milligrams per kilogram. And as you can see, you get really nice dose proportionality within the PK spectrum. Um, but if you look at T equals 18 hours, there's very low amounts of uh, compound found within the plasma. When you then looked at uh, BTK target occupancy at that given 18 hour time point, you see significant target occupancy at both one milligram per kilogram and five milligram per kg. Uh, and look at pharmacological effect, that, that, that then translates into B, B cell activation, where you have significant inhibition of B cell activation, even at significantly elevated time points, such as 16 hours and 24 hours. And this is really the ultimate physiological goal of covalent inhibitors, uh, where you um, knock out the target of interest uh, until uh, protein resynthesis uh, is required to return functional activity. But with covalent inhibitors, there is a significant toxicological uh, risk and um, performing the um, screening for um, reactive metabolites is really key to minimize this. And this is um, very uh, much um, a reason for failure of uh, multiple um, uh, approved drugs long after um, the clinical evaluation has been undertaken. Uh, and very much this is uh, dose dependent. Um, if you can um, produce a, a drug with a, a very low um, predicted human dose, then the, the chance of having um, drug drug interactions is minimized. Um, and just uh, here is listed uh, some of the, the symptoms that can be undertook, uh, such as uh, acute liver injury. Um, there can also be cutaneous reactions, uh, such as uh, rash or Stephen Johnson syndrome. Um, or you can have um, you know, uh, uh, additional um, interaction with the innate immune system. Uh, and this really can be uh, life-threatening conditions. So the final section I'd like to talk about uh, is PK uh, therapeutic index. Um, so this here is uh, four simulations of um, alternate dosage and clearance values for, um, for a covalent inhibition uh, with an active target and a counter target. So if we look at the example in the top left, so we have a dose of 10 mg per kilogram and a high clearance. Uh, and as you can see, um, we see um, significant um, protein uh, occupancy, even though the PK profile shows extremely rapid clearance. And that's one of the advantages of covalent inhibitors is having high clearance is not detrimental to the program and can uh, sometimes be tolerated. Then when we look into an alternate example where uh, clearance is reduced uh, down to 5 mg per mg per kg, which is a, a low clearance value, um, as you can see, uh, we get um, a, a much longer duration of PK profile. Uh, we get very similar uh, protein B occupancy. However, we get ever increasing uh, inhibition of the anti-target and that can have significant issues in terms of toxicity. And obviously we need to um, appreciate that that's dependent on um, turnover rates of the protein. So if the turnover of protein F is rapid, uh, then the risk of that should be uh, minimized. Then if we look at the alternate example in the bottom left, we have a much lower dose, so 0.25 uh, mg per kg, um, and we have a, a moderately low clearance. And, and as you can see with this example, we have um, a good um, protein B occupancy, uh, whereas the formation of the anti-target protein F occupancy is minimized. And, and this really uh, is a nice scenario that we'd like to look for within a, a PK profile of a covalent inhibitor. Then when we look at the final example in the bottom right, we have a low dose but a high clearance. And as you can see, the levels of protein B occupancy are minimal. And, and actually, whether we um, get past the, the, the level of efficacy or, or, or the receptor occupancy of this program um, is at high risk for this example. Uh, so thank you a lot for listening. And I'll, ask, I'll pass you over to Jamie to talk about some case studies. 
But just before we go to Jamie, so Jamie will have case studies picking up where Daniel left off in just a second. First of all, we're going to learn a little bit more about you with our next poll. So let's get the poll up on screen now. So which of these techniques would you use in your screening cascade for a covalent inhibitor program? Uh, any of those techniques, you can tick multiple boxes. So do please tick any boxes that are techniques that you would be using in that program. And once you've uh, voted for yourself, then that's a great time to get in any questions that you have about any of the content that we've seen so far. We do still have uh, the case studies from Jamie and then a wrap up coming back to Tilly. Uh, so there's still more to come, but any questions that you have about anything that's gone so far, now is the time to get them in. So we're just going to let this run for a few more seconds. So do get your votes in uh, ASAP before we close this down and then we'll share the results and you can see uh, where you are, how you sit, how your own experience compares to the rest of our audience. And just a reminder for people who came in a bit late, if you missed the beginning of this, don't worry, we'll send you a link to the recording so you'll be able to catch up with anything that you uh, missed at the beginning. And once again, there will be a, an exit survey after the webinar. Please fill that in. We find it really helpful to find out what you enjoyed and how we can make the most of these webinars in the future. I think that's probably enough time on that poll. So let's close that poll down, have a quick look at the results. And these, of course, will be able to help shape the answers that our panelists give when they come for the live Q&A after the second bit of recording. So 56% of you by far the first using IC50, uh, and then a reasonably even spread for all of the other sorts of techniques in there. So clearly there's a variety of techniques in use, and it'll be very interesting to see how that plays into the Q&A section later. So keep your questions coming in. We're going to hand over now to Jamie Stokes to do the uh, the, the final part of this presentation, this pre-recorded presentation, and then we'll come back to all of our speakers for Q and A straight after that. Thank you very much, Daniel. So the first case study I'd like to talk about today is Aussie Myrtle. Uh, it was developed by AstraZeneca uh, and approved by the FDA in 2015 and the EC in 2016 to treat non-small cell lung cancer with the EGFR T790M mutation. Now, ozimertinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor designed to inhibit EGFR irreversibly and have prefer preferential activity against the double mutant, which includes the T790M mutation relative to the wild type protein. And the reason for this desired selectivity profile is the inhibition of wild type protein is not thought to contribute to clinical efficacy, but is likely responsible for adverse side effects such as diarrhea and skin rash. So the reason for Ozimertin development uh, was because most people treated with first in line EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors develop resistance within 10 to 16 months. And in 60% of cases, this is due to the T790M mutation of the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is positioned at the entrance of the ATP active site, mutation of which increases ATP binding affinity, but can uh, render EGFR ATP competitive inhibitors such as gefitinib orders of magnitude less potent. And on the left hand side here, you can see that the threonine gatekeeper residue is in really close proximity to the halogenated ring of gefitinib. So, a number of second generation irreversible inhibitors were subsequently developed uh, using the gefitinib as a template. Now these uh, molecules were designed with a pendant acrylamide moiety in order to covalently target the cysteine 797 in the kinase solvent channel. And it was hoped that such a strategy would overcome the increase in ATP binding affinity that the double mutant experiences. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, afatinib and canatinib are two such examples of the second generation irreversible inhibitors, but neither showed any selectivity for the double mutant over the wild type protein. So the first hit from AZ screening campaign was compound one on the left, uh, which was found to have 88 fold selectivity for the double mutant over the wild type. Computational docking of compound one suggested that the aniline metaposition of compound one was the most suitable location for the acrylamide side chain in order to target the cysteine 797. A first round of synthesis resulted in the formation of compound two, which was crystallized in the presence of the EGFR protein, and the desired covalent bond to the pendant cysteine was identified. 
Attempts to improve potency and reduce lipid felicity resulted in the formation of compound three. Later, exchange in the pyrolyzopyridine for an indole resulted in increased potency. Indole methylation reduced off-target activity, but also reduced double mutant selectivity. Although some of this was later recovered by removal of the chlorine atom. The end result was ozimertinib and its binding pose to the EGFR protein was also elucidated using X-ray crystallography. So as Daniel said earlier, um, one way to optimize covalent inhibitors is to measure the K-inactive AKI, but AZ didn't do this. Instead, they intended to establish a suitable reactivity window and learn how to synthesize combines that might fit into their intended range. And they did this by measuring the second order rate constant for reaction of the compounds with glutathione. Now they chose their reactivity window based on glutathione half-lives between 25 minutes and 400 minutes as the upper limit, as any less reactive compounds were found to have PIC 50s of less than seven. And this slide really summarizes some of their key observations. Firstly, the electronics of the right-hand side analog ring made a big difference to electrophilic reactivity. Exchange in a methoxy group for a hydrogen resulted in a reactivity increase by a factor of 2.6. Additionally, it was found that both acetylenes and ethene sulfonamides were more reactive than the acrylamides by a factor of greater than 20. Unsurprisingly, changing to the left-hand side portion of the molecule had far less effect on the electrophilic reactivity. So the first synthesis of ozimertinib was very straightforward and it's shown here. Deprotonation of indol 2 and quenching with 2,4-dichloropyrimidine 1 resulted in the formation of compound 3, which was later methylated. Two SNAR reactions resulted in the formation of compound 7. Nitro reduction and acylation was used to furnish ozimertinib. Now, as Caroline said earlier, this approach of attaching the electrophilic Michael acceptor as the last step in the chemical synthesis is very typical. So my final case study is going to be focused on KRAS. So KRAS functions as a molecular switch and regulates cellular processes by alternating between its GTP bound active form, which engages downstream effector proteins, and its GDP bound inactive form. So KRAS has long been considered the holy grail of cancer, and this is because mutations in the RAS gene occur in greater than 30% of human cancers. One of the most common mutations is the KRAS G12C mutant, which is found in 13% of lung edema carcinoma cases and 5% of colorectal carcinomas, which collectively comprises an annual worldwide patient population of greater than 100,000 individuals. Now, these mutations are known to impair GTP hydrolysis, which leaves KRAS fixed in its functional active state, which then, which then later drives abnormal cellular processes. So prior to 2013, some reports suggested that KRAS was an undruggable target due to its picomolar affinity for GTP and its lack of well-defined binding pocket amenable to small molecule inhibition. The breakthrough ka one showcat illustrated an approach whereby a covalent inhibitor, such as compound 1 shown at the bottom, targeted the mutant cysteine 12 of the KRAS G12C mutant by irreversibly forming a covalent bond and binding in a previously undiscovered binding pocket. Now, these inhibitors relied on the mutant cysteine for binding and they did not affect the wild type protein. And this was also replicated in vitro. When treated, with, uh, well, when treated with the small molecules, a group of cancer cell lines containing the G12C mutant showed decreased viability and increased apoptosis relative to the group of cell lines lacking the G12C mutant. And this is really important because it suggests that this covalent approach could allow selective inhibition of mutant KRAS, correspondingly avoiding essential KRAS function in healthy cells, which could lead to a better side effect profile in the clinic. And indeed, the authors conclude their paper by indicating that this would be a really good starting point for targeting the KRAS G12C mutant. 
So several years of research and many papers and programs later, there is finally evidence for this approach in the clinic. One such irreversible inhibitor is, uh, of KRAS G12C is AMG510. Here, the team from Amgen screened a library to yield a hit, which they elaborated using structure-based drug design to give their clinical candidate. Now, the key challenge in this program was to overcome the semi-restricted rotation of the biaural bond, which gave rise to atrope isomers with a half-life of eight days. Now, this value needed to be increased by restricting rotation further, or by freeing up rotation and completely eliminating the atrope isomerism. For this case, the researchers chose the latter strategy, and the addition of the methyl group restricted rotation further to give a configurationally stable compound with a half-life of greater than 180 years. Initial data from the first in-man phase one clinical study indicates that AMG510 is well tolerated and does have anti-tumor activity. So another compound at the forefront of KRAS inhibition is MRXC849, which is an optimized small molecule starting from compound one. Removal of the hydroxyl group prevented glucuronidation and which resulted in an increase in oral bioavailability. The addition of a cyanomethyl group displaced the water molecule and allowed a hydrogen bond to be formed to the backbone NH of the glycine 10 residue. This resulted in a 400 times potency boost, and the R isomer was found to be 100 times more active than the S isomer. The addition of the 8 chlorine filled a small lipophilic pocket, and the addition of the 2 fluoroacrylamide decreased electrophilic reactivity and reduced glutathione metabolism, uh, thereby imparting whole blood, whole blood stability and a half-life of greater than 50 hours. And again, the initial data shows that MRXT, MRXT849 is well tolerated um, and has anti-tumor activity in both lung and colon cancer patients. Uh, building on this prototype KRAS story, the top 15 most acquired cystine mutations in cancer have been modeled. 14 of these have been found exposed on the protein surface, and most are found near cavities uh, amenable to small molecule binding and inhibition. And we, there, we therefore expect this type of strategy to be an extremely active research area in the years to come. So with that, I'd like to pass on to Tilly uh, to summarize. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so to sum up today, um, the current state of play in covalent drug discovery is seeing something of a renaissance, uh, as I outlined at the, the beginning of this presentation, and that's a recognition that many of the areas for concern can also be areas of advantage if they're uh, managed carefully. Um, so a, an example of that might be some of the early concerns around idiosyncratic toxicity and immunogenicity. Um, and this had arisen through some of the early covalent uh, inhibitors being very reactive and nonspecific in their um, mechanism of action in the body. More modern assay methods and the understanding that we now have of the tuning of warhead reactivity has meant that we're able to design strategies to enhance target selectivity and mitigate some of these risks. Also in terms of um, our improved assays for assessing target potency, um, we're able to use that to our benefit to target higher potency inhibitors um, and as uh, Daniel showed in his um, PKPD slides and showing some of the impact um, that tuning your potency versus your PK profile can have in terms of managing the in vivo safety profile of your covalent inhibitors. There's also um, an, a, an emerging um, area looking at increasing the safety of these agents by targeting um, specific residues which are only present in mutated proteins which are responsible for the disease. And this obviously can deliver um, exquisite selectivity um, and safety uh, as has been, um, it is currently being investigated in some of the KRAS case studies that um, Jamie outlined at the end of the talk. 
throughout this, there are the, um, the benefits that this method can give in terms of um, targeting uh, proteins which are difficult to drug with um, reversible inhibitor approaches. This um, can be seen in, in some uh, kinases where you have a highly abundant, high affinity endogenous ligands, which can be difficult to compete with, with a small molecule um, reversible strategy. And you have the added benefit with the covalent inhibitor of affording prolonged target engagement, which can be used to your benefit. Um, obviously, in terms of targeting um, specific residues which have been mutated in the disease, there is also the risk um, that uh, you could see increased um, drug resistance um, if that particular residue were to be mutated. So this is uh, a, a, a benefit of the approach, but it is also a potential in inherent risk. So what's next in covalent inhibition? Well, the, the, the field is, is very active and there are many new areas which are um, people are looking at um, at the moment. Uh, Caroline outlined at the beginning, a number of groups are now looking beyond cysteine um, as the nucleophilic uh, residue. Cysteine is not the most abundant of amino acids, um, but as you increase uh, the abundancy of the amino acids that you're looking at, you need to become more sophisticated in the design strategies to target that particular residue. Um, and we're beginning to see um, de more development in that area and the successful targeting of, for example, lysine residues um, as we move forward. We're also um, seeing this approach expanding into new target classes and being considered for, for broader therapeutic areas as a design approach, so not exclusively to oncology um, drug, drug discovery research, as has been recently. And as um, Daniel also alluded to, um, the more traditional approach of beginning with a reversible inhibitor and using computational methods to target a vector to add the warhead to is now also being complemented by um, fragment-based uh, approaches and, and approaches which begin with the reactive warhead and, and grow out from there. And there are also some interesting um, merging of um, novel technologies such as Protax with the covalent modality. Um, and this is also an area which we think will be very interesting to um, keep an eye on for the future. So I hope you've enjoyed our um, presentation today and you have a feel for some of the considerations that a medicinal chemist needs to think about when embarking on a covalent inhibitor program. I believe we have uh, a little bit of time left for some questions and I will hand you back over to the moderator to, to chair that, those questions. Thanks. Thank you very much for that recording, Tilly. I'm delighted to say everybody's with us now. Let's launch our final poll and then we'll hand over to uh, Q&A. So do pharmacological advances uh, outweigh the safety concerns in covalent drug discovery? Simple yes or no, give us your opinion now. And while you're doing that, I'm going to reintroduce all four of our speakers today. So we are joined on the line live by Tilly Bingham, Caroline Rigby, Jamie Stokes and Daniel Glynn, uh, all of whom you've just heard in the presentation, but they're now also here here to answer your questions. So we'll just make sure everybody's mics are live and then we should be able to hear you all. And what I will do, uh, because Tilly knows this subject inside out and she can see all of your questions, I will hand over to Tilly to pick a couple of questions and uh, pick the right person to answer them. Thank you very much everyone for that recording. Thank you for joining us here today. I think you certainly hear some people, I'm not sure who we do and don't have yet. Looks like we have Caroline. Hi Caroline. Hiya. And we've got Daniel on the line as well. Hello. Hi, Daniel. And I think Tilly's up already. You yeah, hi. So I, see, I see we've got some questions coming in. Ben, shall I begin with those or do you want to wait to the end of the poll? 
let's we'll, tell you what let's close the poll now and we'll see what people thought so uh 69 percent believe that pharmacological advances outweigh the safety concerns in covalent drug discovery uh 31 percent uh, think they don't so there we go that was our final poll we'll close that thank you to everybody for uh, doing the poll tilly take it away with the questions yeah sure so i see we just have five minutes left so i'll, I'll go straight in so looking here we have a question which looks like it's for you Jamie um it's one of the KRAS compounds MRXT849 why does the addition of the fluorine in the two position decrease the reactivity of the acrylamide I think you mentioned okay. it we, we agree it's, it seems a little bit counterintuitive but the fluorine has low pairs on it which can donate into the carbon oxygen plus per antibond of orbitals and this has the effect of increasing the energy of the LUMO, which makes the carbon less effective to it, and therefore less reactive to cysteine nucleophiles. This is a very similar explanation to why you might expect esters to be less reactive than ketones. Okay, just, just while we're with you, Jamie, we've got another question about osimertinib, a question around the metabolic phase, what happens to osimertinib? Yeah, so the osimertinib, the two main pathways are both indole and side chain demethylation of the corresponding nitrogen acids. And the, the the other sort of small amount is um small amount of uh, metabolism is you see the N oxide formed on the side chain amine as well. Okay, and there, there are a few questions around the, the sort of PK. Um I think maybe one for you, Caroline. Question around some of the functional groups look very reactive. Have any of them been used successfully in vivo? Yeah, there are a couple of examples because you're quite right. I mean, they, they are some very reactive um, molecules. But um, as you saw in the slide, actually, was the example of carfilzomib, <laughs> which is a, a drug for myeloma and it's got an epoxide warhead on it. There's also a couple of examples in, in the sulfonyl fluoride series from the sharpest group of TTR inhibitors as well. They're, they're not marketed drugs, but they have been tested in in vivo uh, assays. Yeah, great. So I think in, in light of time, maybe just one, one more quick question. Um, again, for you, Caroline, what's the mechanism of the <coughs> covalent inhibition between methionine and the oxaziridine warhead? Yes, yeah, so in the example uh, I showed in the slides, uh, it's not obvious at first because it's a thioether rather than a thiol, but you basically get attack of the lone pair with the sulfur onto the nitrogen of the oxaziridine, um, which then sort of kicks out the aldehyde to give you your, it's a, I guess, a sulfanamine product. Just to expand on that a little bit, there is a recent paper from the Macmillan Group using methionine, but it's actually not sulfur that acts as the nucleophile. In this case, they use the photoredox chemistry to generate a carbon centered radical, which can be used to do micro additions. So that's a sort of interesting example that's ever slightly different reactivity. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's more used for bioconjugation, isn't it, than the actual yes. inhibitor strategy at the moment. Yes. Yeah. yes, I guess so. It's very, very current work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, we have got a few more questions, but I'm conscious of time, Ben, so maybe if I hand back to, to you. Well, thank you very much. So the good thing is we keep a record of all of these questions. So we will pass these questions on to Concept Life Sciences. If they uh, have something that they can offer and they're happy to get in touch, then they will drop you a line. So thank you very much. And a huge thank you to you, Tilly, for managing that. I know we didn't give you much time, but you've done a great job. Thank you to Daniel, Jamie and Caroline for joining us as well. And thank you for providing the recorded presentation. Uh, I know it takes a lot of effort to do these things in advance and make sure you get everything right. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. All also to everyone else at Concept Life Sciences who've helped us put this webinar together and to my team at Chemistry World, Chris and Francis, who've been uh, going through everything in the background to keep things running smoothly. Now, thank you also, and importantly, to you guys at home for joining us today, uh, giving up an hour of your time to learn about emerging strategies in covalent inhibition with our partners, Concept Life Sciences. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for engaging in the poll. Uh, as a thank you for everybody who attended live, you will get that certificate in your inbox soon, as well as a link to the recording so you can go back and catch up with anything you've missed. Do please fill in the exit survey on your way out. And if you're interested in what other webinars Chemistry World have done in the past or coming up, then have a look at chemistryworld.com slash webinars.
But that's it from me and from this presentation today. Thank you once more to everyone at Concept Life Sciences and in particular to our four speakers today. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and I'll see you in the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks very much.